Susan Sontag is one of America's best-known writers. She is also an activist on issues she cares about. One of those issues is the war in Bosnia, from which she just returned five days ago. She spent the month of July there. It was her eighth visit. Joining me now is Susan Sontag. Welcome back to this broadcast. I'm glad to be here, John. Uh, tell me when you first got interested. When did you first go to the Balkans? I, well, I, of course, I'd been a little bit as a tourist to yeah. Dubrovnik and uh, once to a writer's conference in Slovenia. But to me, it was just Yugoslavia. I, w I was very unaware of, of the politics of that part of the world. And it was when the war started. Uh, first, when the Serbs attacked Croatia and started shelling Dubrovnik. And I got calls from people I knew, and I thought it was just so amazing. And these are writers and intellectuals? No, who, well, friends. Who friends. are calling you saying what? Saying, um, well... That's very interesting. America should do something. Isn't that the theme of the war in one way? I mean, America's going to be the, the white knight that will save these little countries because America stands for truth and justice and morality and has signed the convention that denounces and, and exacts intervention in cases of genocide and so forth. And then uh, my son, David Reef, started going in 92 and did a piece on ethnic cleansing yeah. for The New Yorker. And then I turned up on invitation uh, from somebody who ran an art gallery in Sarajevo. I couldn't believe anyone was running an art gallery in the middle of a siege and barrage of shells and sniper fire at the beginning of April 93. And that was only, I say now only, uh, one year after the war had begun. It was actually the anniversary of the beginning of the war. I got there beginning of April 93, the war, that is, the Serbs turned their attention to Bosnia beginning of April 92. And I've been going back ever since. And what do you do when you go there? Well, the first time I just poked around and listened to people and watched and was horrified and terribly depressed. And then I decided I wanted to come back and do some work. So the next time I, I came back for a couple of months and I worked in the theater, I did a production of Waiting for Godot, which I was, had been asked to direct something in the theater. And I was so excited by the idea that people wanted to do theater in the middle of this horror. And it had a big impact, and uh, there were a lot of f foreign journalists there at the time. This was the summer of 93, waiting for the American intervention. I mean, it was like waiting for Godot. And so what I did got a lot of attention. Uh, but then I, I came back again and again and again, and since then I haven't worked in the theater. I've been working with elementary school children in various projects, uh, with the independent radio, and doing whatever I can, whatever people ask me to do. And what's your mission there? I mean, in a sense, I mean that not in some highfalutin way, but in a sense, what do you hope to accomplish? Well, I don't know what I hope to accomplish. I mean, in one way, I'm a witness. Uh, in other ways, I'm just somebody who wants to pitch in. If I were, uh, had medical training, I'd work in a hospital. If I had any other kind of skill, I'd just do what I can there. I'm not, I'm not doing it, uh, I can't stop the war. But I think it means a lot of people that an, it means a lot to people that an independent um, uh, uh, foreigner wants to come and work there part time in the city. And I've in fact been made an honorary citizen of Sarajevo in a sort of ridiculous ceremony with the with the mayor in a building yeah. where the shells were falling, bang, 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 as this little ceremony was going on. I was very touched that they wanted to do that. So. I just want to pitch in. I, it horrifies me that the Bosnians have been abandoned. It horrifies me what's being done there. And it's just my minuscule contribution as a private citizen. I don't represent anybody at all. And so you come home and, in a sense, having talked to the people of Sarajevo, the citizens of Sarajevo who've been under siege and, and have seen uh, snipers shoot uh, some of the, their loved ones and have experienced the worst kind of of siege and deprivation and have witnessed also uh, genocide and witnessed ethnic cleansing and all of that. You've seen all of that. What do you say to your fellow Americans about what they should be uh, thinking and doing? Well, I think the failure of, of the failure of the United States to support Bosnia, to help repel the Serb aggression is a, an, a calamity. Uh, uh, I know that, that countries don't act just on moral grounds. I mean, they this act could on be, national interest. This could be the greatest injustice in the history of the world. But if the United States would, would not see an interest, then I would understand perfectly well that we don't do anything about it, even though, as I said, we are signatories to the Genocide Convention. Uh, but I think it is in our interest. And, uh, because? I th because, because. Uh, not to do it 
destabilizes Europe. It is there are strategic areas in in the world which in which it's an American interest that they be relatively stable. This is it's not only what's happening in the Balkans, which is rapidly becoming a wider war because there has been no intervention. Now Croatia is coming into the war; it's going to continue to spread. But it is uh, a definitive blow, uh, indeed, the collapse of NATO and of the United Nations. To the United Nations will never recover from its failure in Bosnia, and neither will NATO from its reluctance to to act. And I, uh, the United well, I don't States think NATO has, has been as reluctant to act as it is. It's been hamstrung by. Uh, the fact that the cards have been held in the end by the member nations of the United Nations. And the United Nations hasn't acted because the member nations didn't force well, it to ultimately act. this is a Security Council action and Boutros Ghali says, I'm the servant of the Security Council, I don't have any policies of my own. Of course we know that the, he does. And he recently said in touring Africa, he doesn't understand why people are paying so much attention to Bosnia. He has his own agenda, and so does Mr. Akashi. But ultimately, this Mr. is Akashi a story. Being the UN representative in charge of the UN exactly, over there. Exactly, from Japan. But ultimately, this is a, a decision of the great powers to let the Serbs have the victory because they don't want to risk anything. And I think they're risking something much worse. I think there's a real failure of leadership. In, in this country, we have a president who dislikes foreign policy, who has no feeling for po foreign policy, who only understands foreign policy in terms of trade relations. Uh, we've well, never the Clinton had administration would step down, I would argue with you, that at long last they get it in a part, in part. And they would say, look, you know, we have forced the, we have forced the NATO uh, countries to adopt at least, at least some forward motion in terms of uh, airstrikes in, to protect the enclaves and the safe areas. They have finally, at long last, gotten their act together to make that threat. I don't believe real. it. I don't believe it. The threat's first not of all, real, or they don't. I think, first of all, the threat's not real, and the threat has been made countless times, starting with countless UN resolutions to protect the safe areas. But the, the Serbs have stopped temporarily. They haven't stopped. They, they, the line has been drawn at Garage Day, and right. it's, it's like saying a green light to Sarajevo, Tuzla, and Bihaj. It's almost like a joke. Let me, let me read you something. I brought it along because I didn't want to paraphrase it. It's so marvelous. Uh, this is a spokesman for Karatich in, in Pale, the headquarters of the so-called Serb Republic of Bosnia. The Serbs are amazed by the international community's capacity for self-deception. The international community is sick and it needs help. We, the Serbs, intend to sober it up. The Serbs have complete contempt for the resolution and the serious no, will to do anything in, in Bosnia. And they can, countless resolutions, starting with the safe havens or safe areas resolutions have been passed, and they don't believe it, and they're right not to believe it. This London conference where they said, okay, if you move in garage day, we're going to bomb, is a joke. Then they just don't move in garage day and they move everywhere else. Yeah. You in Tuzla? Yes. What was the, tell me what it was like to be there. Well. This was in July. I was in Sarajevo when, uh, for most of July, and I was there in Srebrenica, uh, excuse me, I was there when Srebrenica fell. Uh, you were uh, in Sarajevo when Srebrenica fell. Exactly. When the news came that Srebrenica was falling. You spent that evening in part with the Prime Minister. Actually, I had made an arrangement to have dinner uh, um, alone with, with uh, Harris Elijic, whom I know from previous visits, and I went, and he was supposed to come and pick me up, and then we were going to go out to dinner in what passes in Sarajevo for a restaurant. I mean, you have to imagine a town in which there's no water, no electricity, no gas. Uh, uh, every kind of amenity is lacking, but there are little basement places with candles where you can get something of uh, uh, food because, of course, the, in a city of siege is a city of black market, so I can't say that nobody has any food. That's not true. People with money uh, can buy food on the black market. Anyway, he was supposed to pick me up, and then I got a message that I had to come to his office because this terrible thing was happening. Shrebenica was falling, and I sat the whole evening until about midnight in this dark office and he was talking on the phone about every half hour and the last call at 11 o'clock and he looked close to tears and he'd looked incredibly depressed all evening and we know each other very well and we talked about all kinds of things because he's a very large guy and we talked about a lot of things besides bosnia i was amazed that he could but the last call and he hung up the phone and i said who is it and he said it's the mayor of srebrenica who's calling to say goodbye meaning 
in a couple of hours he would be dead. Then about a week later, I was in Tuzla, and I went to the air base. I saw these 15,000 refugees, 98% of whom I would say are women and children, small children, under the age of 10. There were a handful, I would say, so five, 10, 20 very elderly men. In other words, only the women and children got out. There are 10,000 men and boys between the age of 12 and 65 missing among the refugees, and there's every reason to believe that they have been slaughtered. The Serbs behaved there. I don't say they behaved exactly the same way in Jeppa, the next of the safe havens to fall, but they behaved exactly the way the Nazis did when they went into Poland, when they went into Russia, just lining up villages and shooting, and worse than shooting, killing people with knives by the hundreds at a clip. And all the refugees in, in, uh, from Srebrenica and Tuzla Air Base say they saw piles and piles of corpses. I talked to a girl of 14 who had seen, just a couple of days earlier, both her parents have their throat cuts, uh, throats cut. She witnessed cut. it? Yes. Well, the, the Serb soldier came into the house and slit her parents' throats and then pushed her out. I don't know why she was spared. I know, and I, and uh, she wasn't raped, by the way. She was 14. She was very disturbed. She was a little crazy, in fact. But her parents said they just burst in and they cut her parents' throats and then pushed her out on the road and she found her way in with a crowd of refugees. How do they continue? The because Bosnians? They yes. Well, you know, this situation, Charlie, has no bottom. I, every time I go, and this is the eighth time I've gone, I say I cannot, I cannot imagine a situation more sad, more humiliating, more tearful. I mean, you meet somebody, I mean, I, I can tell you a hundred stories. You meet somebody who says, uh, I'm going to two funerals today. Two friends of mine, this is in Sarajevo. The editor actually, he was the, he's the editor of the newspaper there, Oslo, Virginia. So I'm going to two funerals today. Yesterday, two friends of mine, different sides of the city, uh, were killed by shells. Uh, I turn up at the radio station, Radio Zid, a wonderful organization run by a great friend of mine who was a law professor, and now he's running this independent radio station. And 15 minutes before I get there, a shell has landed right in front of the radio station. Two children are killed. How do they stand it? They are in total despair. They can't stand it. And, it's and how do they feel about us and the French and the British and the Dutch? Despair, indignation, disbelief, a lingering hope that continues even though they have it had no well, reason part to of the argument as you know is that the bosnian government is n as long as they believe that uh the united states will end the embargo unilaterally that they will not agree to any kind of settlement because they believe that in the end what they want is not to settle certainly not to settle when the serbs have seventy percent of their country and therefore what they will do is continue to refuse and hold out to any kind of political settlement negotiate a settlement what most people believe in the end is the only way that this will but come Charlie, to an end that's not true first of all i'm What's a great admirer of senator dole for this initiative and i'm absolutely for lifting the embargo and right. very pleased that he's done what he's and done and you're also in favor of using airstrikes whenever absolutely they might yes it's long inflict punishment and fact, stop the serbs absolutely but the fact is they have signed on to the contact group agreement which in which a sir uh, as the serbs would get 49 percent right. of bosnia and a Muslim, so-called Muslim, Croat Federation would get 51%. The Bosnian government, the so-called Muslim government, which includes many loyal Serbs and Croats, but anyway, is mainly so-called Muslim, uh, has signed that. The Croatian government has signed it. The Serbs have not signed it. It is not true. It's an absolutely false statement that they want to fight to the end. On the contrary, they know perfectly well they cannot win militarily. They signed on last year, when the last proposal of the contact group came, they agreed, reluctantly, sadly, but they knew the hope of actually keeping a multicultural Bosnia within the borders of former Bosnia is a lost cause. What they so, want is 51%. Okay, is but that's 51%. not that. They, everybody agrees that they, a multicultural Bosnia is a lost cause. That on these the total two, territory of Bosnia. These ethnic groups Bosnia. cannot live together. They have to live side by side. Uh, in, Even though Sarajevo is a multicultural city, in forty-nine percent of Bosnia, the part that will be controlled by the Serbs, yes, but in the part controlled by Bosnia, I know. Listen, a whole family of Jehovah's Witnesses was just slaughtered the other day in the streets of Sarajevo. Mother, father, and and five-year-old child. 
I know Jews in Sarajevo, I know, and I know people of different faiths in Tuzla. Suppose the President of the United States would say the moral urgency here is overwhelming. Mm -hmm. We have to, uh, if no one else will go with us, we have to exercise the kind of leadership that the world has thrust on us as the remaining superpower mm -hmm. and because of our values and our traditions. And I, the President of the United States, will send American men and women there, will use American might in order to stop that war. Would you stand up and say that's the right thing to do at long last? Yes. Except that this president will never do it. Well, and, and, and this, this senator, Robert Dole, is not in favor of that either. There is no American politician in favor of sending American men and women there. Yeah. Well, I don't think that's entirely true, but by and I large... I don't know who uh, they are. By and large, yes, America wants cost-free exactly. wars. But let's say the, uh, the answer is not abandoning Bosnia or sending hundreds of thousands of American yeah. soldiers. Anybody who knows anything about politics knows there are a lot of different ways right. in which you put pressure on the Serbs to sign. All the Serbs have to do is sign the contract, the contact group resolution uh, recommendation and the war will be over. And how do you put that pressure on the Serbs? Economic pressure, first of all, serious economic pressure, political pressure. Well, that and is serious economic pressure. Nonsense. The embargo on the Serbs is absolutely useless. Belgrade is flourishing. And the, and the Serb army is being continually restock, restocked. The, the embargo effect. From effects, Serbia? No, from Greece, through from Greece, Greece right. and through Romania and elsewhere. It has no effect on the Serbs at all. But pressure can be put, serious pressure. And then, you d and then air, air war is a serious option here, by which I don't mean bombing Belgrade. I mean bombing roads and bridges and ammunition dumps. For two years, NATO has completely photographed all of Bosnia. They, they, they know where Karatic's toothbrush is. They have pictures of the entire country and everything in it. If they want to bomb, strategically bomb military installations, roads and bridges and what the, the places where all the Serb munitions come right. in, the Serbs would stop in a trice. I often think, sadly, if there were camera crews in Auschwitz, people would have said, oh, well, anti-Semitism is an old story in Europe. Yes, it's really terrible what's going on, but what can we do about it? Uh, never again doesn't, doesn't mean anything, does it? I mean, never again will Germans be allowed to kill Jews in the 1940s. That's, that's true. But do we have uh, the will and the interest to prevent a genocide in Europe now? I mean, it's qu quite amazing to stop it, to limit it. Also, it's a model for a lot of wars of succession in which old communist bureaucrats suddenly become nationalist and fly the nationalist flag. It's a model for a lot of wars that could take place all over the former Soviet empire. People are watching wa the failure of the West intervene yeah. in the Balkans, I, and there will be other wars like it. I'm out of time, but still, there is no groundswell of public opinion in America to do something. Nobody had heard of Kuwait either until Bush got on the air and said, this is really important, this is in the national interest. I don't blame people at all for, for not understanding most people. Why should they? They haven't been told. There's been a consistent disinformation campaign. And, I mean, a country needs leadership. Most people aren't naturally interested in foreign policy and foreign issues. Why should they be? They're interested in their families and their communities. People have to, at this point, you have to have leadership. And the leadership is lacking except uh, Senator Dole and the initiative he represents, even though I agree it's largely symbolic in terms of how it will change things right now. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Chuck. Susan Sontag. We'll be right back. Stay with us.